Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. We're excited for this special episode of Science of Rowing. Um, we're really excited and, and grateful for this opportunity to be able to sit down with Lisa Russell. Um, she's a doctor of physical therapy. Um, and w I mean, she's been at least on my radar for the last year or so. Um, and we've been really excited to connect with her and, and bring her on because she just seems like she's already doing so much good for the sport. And she's also such an avid learner and a lifelong learner that I'm, I'm really excited to see where she goes with her career. So I'll hand it over to Lisa to tell us a little bit more about herself. Well, thank you. That was very nice. Um, so yeah, I mean, I am, I guess, first and foremost, kind of a rower. And then, you know, well, I guess simultaneously went to PT school since I didn't start rowing until college. Um, and really, even during the time when I was training more at the high performance level, uh, I was just drawn more and more towards the fun and the desire to learn more of how to help rowers just like stay healthy and perform better on everything more from the physical therapy standpoint. Um, so I'm fortunate now that that's where I've been able to kind of shift my career focus and, um, you know, my mentors at work at Champion Physical Therapy and Performance in Boston are all just brilliant and so to be able to pick their brains and and be able to develop further my rowing knowledge like with with their knowledge kind of combined is it's just been so much fun um so yeah and and you know that's where I value what you all do at Science of Rowing with research because it, even when I'm in my kind of hole of of working with patients at least I get a little glimpse every month of like oh yeah that would be a really cool thing to look into. And oftentimes what you guys come out with spark a different trend for me to go down, even in playing with things treatment wise with people. So it, you know, it all plays off each other beautifully. It's so it's, you know, nice to learn something new. And you do work with rowers at, at Champion PT as well as at, at CRI, right? Yeah. So at CRI, um, I volunteer with the para national team and I'm fortunate to actually get to go out on the water with them to row myself as well. Um, and so that's volunteering with Jeff, who has been their long-term, excuse me, their long-term team PT. Um, and that I've learned a lot from them, learned a lot from Jeff. Um, and then at champion is, is my, you know, in-person real PT time. Um, and, you know, so I get to, you know, I love it when I get rowers covering my schedule, but I work with just like general athletes too, you know, um, which it's always fun. There's a lot of rowers around Boston, so I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure luckily. Their, their share makes their way in. Yeah. Yeah. And and you're being humble too, because that's that's one of the best places to be working, and and as far as I know, it and is a lot of fun. I've learned I learn something every day. I really do. I, you know, <laughs> makes me happy to go out on the watering. We've been able to go out in doubles um, within our para group since we're we're like spit testing, and a lot of us are vaccinated and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, Rowing with a mask is not the most fun, but I'll do it if I get to hang out in a double, um, you know, so it's great. Yeah, um, I, I read your bio on your website, so I was hoping you could dig into your story a little bit more, especially with the, the car accident and kind of how that's inspired you. Yeah, um, so it will be three years, April 29th that my um, husband, my now husband, and I were hit by a car as pedestrians. Um, so I, I mean, my, my legs were like destroyed. Um, so it's like freaking amazing what your body and what science and medicine can do. Um, and a hundred percent my, I would say drive from being a rower for so long has been a huge piece of my success in recovery thus far. Um, I mean, between being a PT and a rower, right? Like PT knowledge helps a ton, obviously with injury recovery, but then that crazy rower, like, oh, I could just do a little bit more of this, right? And it'll be fine. Doesn't hurt either. So um, uh, so definitely, definitely the two have, have played off of each other and rowing has been, um, you know, a really, a really big piece in my overall recovery anyway, because there's only, I can't run anymore right now anyway. I always say once I get knee replacements, I'll... I'll be at it again, but um, being able to row still and to have already known the sport and already be in the sport and and everything and not, you know, have to learn something new, but just to feel, you know, that like hopping back on a bike again, kind of a feeling, um, you know, it's it's been really great. Um, helps helps my 
my body and my soul and my heart and everything, you know, just kind of get, keep going. So, um, no, it is, it's lucky to have the sport in my life. That's for sure. <laughs> can you, can you go into a little detail in terms of the accident if you're comfortable and, and maybe like what actually happened and, and what your progress was in terms of coming back where you are now, how are you and your yeah, husband sure. are feeling? Yeah. 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 Um, so we, let's see, we were struck by a car who was a 17 year old driver who was high snapchatting and doing you know, lots of things you're supposed to do while you're driving. Um, so he actually hit and killed a woman before he hit us. Um, and one of those wrong place, wrong time, just moments, right? Nothing, nothing else you could do about it. Um, so I was at Mass General Hospital, which is a trauma center in Boston for a month um, for, gosh, I honestly couldn't even tell you how many surgeries I had while I was there. I haven't bothered to count, but it was a lot. Um, so they, I mean, I have metal in every, every bone in my leg pretty much. Um, and then I had massive skin loss and even muscle loss. So they moved, they moved my abs, they moved my rectus abdominis, they moved my lat and my omentum for those of us who are really big anatomy geeks and would like to know all the parts, um, all down to my legs to help just tissue cover and, and make them viable to, to save them. Um, and so I remember it was actually, it was interesting when my surgeon came in to tell me he was going to take part of my lat to like help save my leg. He was like, and don't worry, the only person I've ever had come back to me to tell me that it mattered was a rock climber. And I was like, well, you do know I row, right? <laughs> like you do know it's a sport where we use our lats like a decent amount. And, but I mean, luckily he took it. All I was concerned about at that point was that my right shoulder had been a grumpier shoulder for me over time. I was like, just take it from the left side. Like, just leave my right alone. It's already got enough problems. <laughs> take it from the left side. So, um, and it, it's it's worked out. Um, so I was at Mass General for a month and then I was in inpatient rehab for two and a half. Um, so I was then home three and a half months after the accident. Um, and my full-time job for how long after a little over a year after was really just rehab um like you know going to pt appointments going to medical appointments doing exercise at home i walking i walked a ton literally would walk with you know with my crutches my mom and i walked for hours a day because i was like i just have to move and this is all i got um and then i started back working um, very, very, very part-time. Um, I think it was June of 2019. Um, so I'd really kind of just gotten up and running with things when COVID kind of hit. And even my job at Champion, it only really started in January of 2020. Um, so it's like three months in and, you know, a little, a little challenging to build a new job when a pandemic is happening, but at the same time, it gave me more time to learn. I wouldn't have been able to start my website or do any of that kind of stuff as efficiently as I was able to if that hadn't happened. And now that I go back and try and keep up with it, I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I have no time for this. This takes me forever. But it's still really fun to do when, I, when I'm able to. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's kind of, you know, and then it's, it's there's always something. There's always a little bit of something to work on. And it, it's a life project. But I mean, I feel like for whether it's an aging individual or whether it's, you know, another person managing injury, like all that kind of stuff is you just kind of manage it through and everything gets better with time. So, yeah. yeah. Well, glad yeah. you're here. Glad you found the positive in it. And I'm oh, yeah. sure it's, it's Lots helping your career as well. Right. So, yeah. um, and the website, by the way, is powerhousephysio.com. One of my favorite resources for all things at the intersection of <laughs> rowing and physical therapy for anybody listening. If you like science of rowing, if you like the research brought into the context and the application of rowing, definitely go check it out because you'll love Lisa's website too. Well, thank you. Yeah. So we'll, we'll transition into our articles here. So we're going to kind of divide the two because Will and I did articles that were similar enough that we thought that this would be good to have Lisa on for both. Um, so I'm just going to read a quick article summary of mine, and then I want to give it over to Lisa. So 
my executive summary was researchers analyzed the hip pelvic and knee motion of 11 male rowers while they performed an all out 2k on a concept to erg researchers found an association between greater consistency of hip mobility and 2k performance but no association between average hip mobility and 2k performance this study demonstrates that the consistency of our hip mobility, not just the total amount of mobility, may be one of the keys to peak rowing performance. Coaches and rowers can use this information to train with a focus on hip control in and out of the boat while under different loads, while at different speeds, and while under fatigue. Lisa, what did this study tell you and wh where did it take you? I mean... I honestly really love the the idea of like, okay, we don't necessarily always need to be like maximizing hip range, right? And I, I and Blake, I feel like you've you've said this on Instagram or somewhere else even since. Um, but I feel like the idea of like, okay, here here's what you have, here's the range that you have. We need to be able to maintain this and use it well. I mean, in a, in my head, right? Like you think of um, somebody either like changing their hip flexibility to try and get more, or usually as we fatigue, we use a little bit less and then like our low back starts to come into the picture. And then that's where we get lots of issues. You know, that's where wow, like, yes, if we, if we can just maintain that body over angle, that catch angle and, you know, and not lose it through the drive, like my goodness, what a great difference that would make for people with back pain. You know, that's, that's kind of where to me the the hips and the back, you know, you can't separate them. And you've said that like it's, um, and, you know, especially in, I feel like you picture whether it's like the end of the head of the Charles as people are coming around the Elliott turn and like, everyone's just like starting to die a little bit more and how, how everybody's body gets that extra, you know, loses that hip angle and starts to get that lower lumbar flexion happening more you know it's like wow imagine how much more powerful you would feel in those moments too if you're able to maintain that hip angle if you're able to maintain you know your ribs stacked over your pelvis so that your core is engaged and supporting you and you can still use your glutes you know it's like that whole chain effect is maintained literally just by keeping that hip angle so i i feel like i loved that this study because I feel like that's been said sort of before, but I love that this study said like, you need to just maintain what you have and not necessarily push for like X amount of hip flexion range of motion. Um, it just feels more achievable across, you know, whether juniors to masters rowers, because you're just going to have, you're going to have a range. Um, but for a coach from a launch to be able to see like, oh, so-and-so is not getting their hip through as much as they usually do. Like, let me at least tell them, or maybe we need a break for a sec so they can collect themselves or, you know, the, that's such an easy visual, at least I haven't coached a ton. So I don't totally know. That's where you guys come in. But like, you know, I feel like that's an easy thing to see from the launch. If someone's starting to lose that and people, I feel like have a harder time feeling their back position you know, if you're saying sit up, sit up, sit up for like a slumpy low back, I feel like it's harder to feel that compared to like that, that pelvis position where you can either give them that, that, you know, grounding, like kind of where your sit bones, like come over your sit bones, kind of a cue or, you know, that type of thing um, to just keep that, that pelvis I moving. I was telling Will and Joe that I, f I filmed a video showing like you know, tuck, excessive arch, and my back hurt for two days after just, just demoing that for probably like a minute. Um, right. and, and I also coached it with a client this morning and the big thing for him was like the feel of it. I was like, okay, so let's practice that, that body rock over. Where do you feel that? Is it in right. the hamstrings or is it in the low back? And it was just, it's just like instant feedback. And a lot of people don't realize that you're not supposed to feel it in your low back. So sometimes right. it's just about education and talking to them about that. Um, okay. In terms of, um, so the study said that average average motion didn't relate to 2K performance. Does that mean that hip mobility isn't important? Because sometimes people will take this study and be like, oh, no more stretching. What do you think? So no, I don't think so. You know, you still, you still if you can have it, right? Like if you can have, is, what are you supposed to have like 135 degrees or something like that somewhere in there I'm bad with numbers like that um that you know if you can have that hip range of motion 
you know, you think about what somebody looks like, like in the bottom of a squat, right? If they don't have that hip range of motion, you're just not, you're not going to be able to be as connected or as powerful kind of out of the bottom and out of, you know, you're, you're going to compensate somewhere to try and feel like you're going to get there. And that I feel like is where if you're, if your body is capable of having a range, it's going to know when you're not using it and kind of compensate to get you there with something else. And that's where I feel like that low back piece starts to come in. Um, and granted, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. Hi, buddy. Um, I, I, I'm like picturing kind of how, how people's hips feel, right? When they're tight, like when, when rowers come into me, I always kind of check their hip flexion range. I check their rotation. Um, I check, you know, kind of where their hips like to be. And that's kind of a whole nother ball of wax in terms of rowing with where they like our hips to be. But, um, you know, I, if you're not able to get into that hip, hip flexion, I feel like the first thing that you feel is like your low back pulling and, um, you know, and you, whether it's like, you know, I give somebody a little bit of soft tissue work or I do similar to what you were saying and just do like some positional, like, okay, we're going to do some anterior posterior pelvic tilts. We're going to do a cat cow. We're going to do, you know, just to help them get reacquainted with like where their hips are in relation to their back. You know, I feel like sometimes I barely do anything and then someone stands up and they're like, wow, that's so much better. Or they then go row later that day or the next day and they're like, man, I could actually like feel my core. I could use my glutes, you know, and it's, it's like that small sort of brain to body connection of just like this movement is there. If you can keep using, you know, if you do use it, things will work kind of better. And I feel like that's what this study sort of, at least to me is most impactful for is, um, you know, that, that awareness of where your body is peace, maybe more, right? Because if, if we're saying you need to be able to maintain, you know, how much hip motion you have throughout your row, then, then that, that indicates that you're having at least better body awareness so that as you're getting tired, at least you can think like, okay, I got to get my hips here, got to get my hips here. And then, you know, you just think about how that stacks the chain above and, and kind of below, um, but if you're losing that range, kind of going back to what you asked, Blake, like if you're losing that hip range, like it's not going to stack, you know, you're going to have your hamstrings pull, you're going to have your little back pull, you're going to, and, and like your body's going to do funky things to kind of get there. Now, as somebody who can't now use all of my joints range, like I used to be able to, right. It's been a lot of reprogramming to get my body to realize where my endpoints are and potentially as masters rowers primarily right go through similar things where their body just doesn't like to go there anymore or they start to lose that range then I think from a coach's standpoint you know if if it's not possible to maintain that range you know if they go to a PT or they do whatever exercises and you just can't get that hip range to be there then that's where we have to say like okay well here's your new angle and then we learn how to row out of this new angle and then you maintain that the whole time and you don't as you get tired try and shove further into what you don't have or you don't shy away anymore because either way you know you're going to compromise like whether you're back or you know pretty much anything else but does that make sense yeah that's an awesome perspective because coaches always have a style right but there's also some rowers that need to adjust their style so they can row for life so that, that's, I like that you took it from that, that point of view, when you're working with your rowers, what are some things we don't need to go in great to detail, but what are some things that you do to maintain adequate hip mobility? Um, and then how do you help them translate that over to, into hip control? Um, so I, I mean, generally when something comes in, right, if they're having trouble with especially if I, I kind of check their hips out and see how they feel and they're having trouble getting into full flexion um, or it feels like they're really being driven into external rotation or something. Um, I tend to do like low back soft tissue work. You know, I, I tend to work through low back, through hip rotators. And then a recent favorite spot to check on people is checking people's adductors because I feel like the amount of involvement your adductors or your groin muscles have on hip rotation control on even, you know, their contribution to quads and hamstrings, like your adductors take on in the boat in particular, a lot of stability work and like those guys get locked and like my goodness is up, make your hip feel tight. Um, so I feel like teaching people even just like that those muscles exist <laughs> is, 
tends to be step one. Um, and then, you know, a lot of rowers have never done hip rotator strength stability work. Um, we, you know, we sit and move forward and back. We don't often think of like the fact that our, our hip still needs to travel through that socket smoothly and that all the little movements of the boat are still being controlled somewhere. Um, and I feel like hip rotators are a really big player in all of that. So if a lot of my rowers, I feel like have had a lot of success with like, you know, just adding whether it's like doing their planks with clamshells or, or reverse clamshells or, you know, just like adding that little bit of hip rotation into some of their core work or, um, you know, things that like we all want to do anyway. It's like, okay, well, let's, you know, challenge the movement by you know, challenge the core movement by adding some movement and let's make it dually beneficial so that you're getting some hip like rotator strengthening. Um, and I actually, I worked with a rower this morning who she was having like low back issues, knee issues, like this, that, and the other, you know, really common, just trouble running because her knees would hurt and, and but trouble with her back on the erg. And so over the winter, we developed like a nice little pre-row, just like muscle access. I kind of, that's kind of what I tell people is like, you got to just get stuff to work correctly before you're then asking it to be a, a little piece in a big picture of your movement. So whether that's doing like, you know, five clamshells, five reverse clamshells, some hip abduction, some, you know, hip bridges, some, you know, just get your glutes and your core firing together correctly. And then I feel like a lot of people then are like, wow, I felt so much better when I went on the water, when I took these five minutes to just get my muscles working and feel where they were. And, and, you know, I, I feel like I get that best with my post-collegiate, like, and master's rowers, you know, they, they take the time to, to take care of their bodies a little bit more, which just makes sense. Um, and, you know, and then, and a few juniors coaches who've kind of collaborated with me for like, what do I have my people do before they go on the water, especially with no boathouse right now. And, you know, similar things, like just get them to feel their glutes and their core. That's to me, that's always the like get that control piece kicking in before you hop on the water. Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, I love that you touched on the the rotation piece um, because I think a lot of times, like you mentioned, like rowers think it's just kind of like straight ahead. So if you ever challenge them laterally or you ever challenge them in rotation, they're kind of like, why do I need to do this? And why is this good for my sport? Um, but I've, I've found kind of like you is if I do things that strengthen rotation of the hip, so like airplanes and helicopters, yeah. that tends to really translate over to better movement, uh, yeah, better deadlift usually. position, better squat, better squats, better yeah. rowing performance. Yeah. And I feel like if, I'm sorry. Well, go ahead. For, for people rowing in the single right now, rowers kind of uh, can't necessarily be blamed for thinking that it is just a matter of going forward and backwards. Cause if you're just on the erg, then you are just riding the I-beam forwards and backwards the whole time but in the more dynamic environment of the single like you're really responsible for picking up all that all that extra hip motion so i love that you yeah. Yeah, highlighted that too yeah, and i feel like especially when we're talking about like maintaining hip range and not you know not feeling your hips get tight as you're rowing as they're getting tired and like you know just that that whole chain protecting the back by using your hips like the rotation piece i feel like just adds to your hips ability to like maintain that position for so much longer you know just doing like I don't know, like only glute bridges, like where you're still maintaining just that sagittal plane, like, you know, it's only going to last for so long. It's, you know, I feel like this is where from work I've learned, like the amount of work they do on like all these baseball guys, like rotator cuffs, right. And like the amount of the amount that they work just those small stability muscles and like translating that down to the hip, just, it just makes sense. Like you need those stabilizers to be there and be, have a lot of endurance and be really strong so that you you know, so they don't fatigue and just get tight. And, and I feel like that's where it's always hard to kind of feel that area of your body and like, where's this tightness coming from. But when I, I feel like whenever I put my hands on people, that's like 90% of the time, right? Like, it's like, you are just your hip, like rotator muscles are overworked and they are tight and tired. And that is why you can't move. Um, but kind of all plays in together pretty, pretty close. All right. So in part two, we're going to talk about my article and go into hamstring flexibility specifically. And 
this is a little bit of a, a maybe to kick the hornet's nest kind of thing for for rowing coaching in particular rowers love to stretch hamstrings coaches love to throw hamstring stretching and flexibility around so i'm excited to dig into this with you and hear your opinion about things so a uh, quick summary on the articles they had 17 male junior rowers not known to be the most flexible of the rowing population uh and they measured their hamstring flexibility with the passive knee extension test and then correlated the results of the hamstring flexibility to their spine and pelvic position while they were doing an all out 500 meter erg. They found that hamstring flexibility score had no significant correlation to any of the uh, lumbar spine or pelvic indicators. The only significant correlation was that more experienced rowers used less lumbar range of motion over the stroke. Uh, they did find a small non-significant correlation between hamstring flexibility and lumbar range of motion. They also found that more pelvic range of motion meant less lumbar range of motion. Um, so our takeaways we discussed was uh, we're not saying don't stretch hamstrings ever, but just don't put all of your eggs in the hamstring stretching basket to improve technique, row faster, or have less low back pain. I cited some other studies too that generally show that there's not a very strong connection between pure hamstring flexibility and any number of the rowing indicators that they've studied. So first, similar to part one with Blake, interested in your thoughts or reactions to that. Yeah, I mean, I feel like when I when I saw this one, I thought back to, I don't know if either of you guys were in the, um, the lecture or whatever in the US Rowing Conference this year, but um, I forget who, I, it was one of the biomechanic ones where they they were just like it is not your hamstrings like your knee bends and then your hamstrings are gone like it's not it is not your hamstrings <laughs> you know um and it's just one of those where it's like I, I i mean for once right all rowing studies i feel like are in like junior or collegiate male athletes and and so it's just like okay cool great thanks guys but this one, as you said, it's like actually kind of nice because like growing teenage boys tend to be able to maybe touch their knees, right? Um, and so to see, especially in that like small group of kids that hamstring flexibility is not affecting their rowing stroke, just like, you know, you would think with kind of an older athlete, um, it, nice confirmation, you know, that we still bend our knees and our hamstrings slack and then, and then we can move our body a little bit more normally. Um, but yeah, I, so I, I guess, you know, that was, that was my initial reaction that it was just like, okay, good, lovely. These, these boys who really are not flexible, we are still saying it just, does, it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, but you know, as, as a rowing coach, I can see where like trying to hammer home that hamstring flexibility piece makes a ton of sense. Cause you like try and ask them to just like stand and touch their toes and there's no way they can do it. Um, so, you, so that thought of like, oh my goodness, how are they going to get to the catch if they can't even touch their toes? Um, but you know, it's just one of those like bones grow faster than muscles. And then you got to add some strength to get them to let go and actually gain that flexibility again. Um, do you find that that's pretty true uh, across populations? Because obviously, like the bone, the bone versus muscle growth is most relevant during during puberty for bodies that are growing at different rates. Um, but with other rowers that you've worked with, have you found a similar sort of lack of effectiveness from hamstring stretching and fixing rowing problems? Yeah, I mean, and that's where like usually, you know, like so for example, when somebody comes in to see me like one of the first things I have them do, right, is I just run them through like a gross movement screen, just like any any of us would. And, you know, when I ask them like, okay, can you touch, you know, like show me how you touch your toes. Um, if they can't do it, it's like, okay, well, where do you feel that? you like, do you feel in your hamstrings? Do you feel in your low back? Like, do you just not feel it anywhere? And you really just can't do it. Um, and it's a mixed bag of if I get hamstring versus low back. Um, but you know, then I tend to like have somebody slack a knee to see if they gain some range, take the hamstrings out a little bit kind of a thing. Um, and, you know, and then we, we play with adding some like core stability into their hamstring stuff to, to see if that makes a difference. And, you know, it's it, it very, very rarely do I ever say like, oh my gosh, you just need to stretch your hamstrings and like then your problems will be solved. I don't think I've ever told somebody that. Um, and I don't know as I ever will, because usually there's more there's more of a strength and control side of it because you, you know, especially for the juniors population, the high school, college, like growing people, 
that length tension relationship just is messed up from growing and you have to help them get it back. Um, and typically a really already tight overbone muscle doesn't really respond very well to aggressive stretching, you know, um, might feel briefly better. You might gain a, you know, it's not that you shouldn't do any, like you guys have said, but like a hundred percent, don't just rely on like, okay, guys, we're going to do hamstring stretches and then we're going to get on the water. Like not going to get anywhere. Right. You getting, um, you know, whether it's, a, I don't know, I feel like people respond better in some ways to slightly more dynamic work in that way, right? Getting your muscles warmer so that they're longer rather than, or, or more supple rather than like cranking on them. Um, I feel like I can just picture like, you know, juniors regattas with circles of people just like stretching each other's hamstrings, you know, before they get in the water or whatever. And it's like, well, sure, try it. But um one of the things I think about there is like, if it worked that well, we wouldn't be having this conversation because sort of yeah. the fact that like, we're always talking about stretching hamstrings and stretching right. hamstrings is kind of indication that maybe it's not doing what we think it's doing. Totally. Uh, yeah. But, like stretching is not that complicated. We can all relatively do that well. And, and yeah, no, good point. Just to break down a couple things that, that you've said for the audience, the knee bend slack hamstrings issue. Right. is the issue of the short head of the hamstring and the long head of the hamstring and the fact that when you're at the catch, if the knee's bent, then the hamstring can't be at its maximum length. Right. I mean, you even just think about when when you either are stretching somebody's hamstrings and they're tight or you go to do a straight leg raise or something, the first thing that happens when you hit that point where your hamstring is tight is your knee bends. You know, like that's your body's reaction to like shortening or yeah, shortening that muscle so that you can gain more movement. So like, that's what we do. We <laughs> bring our bodies over, we bend our knees, we go up the slide, you know, so. Um, so you basically hit your maximum hamstring length at that rock over body position before the knees start to bend. Then as soon right. as the knees are bending, it's not a problem, the hamstring flexion. No, because then you're, so. I mean, then you're like progress, especially, right? right? It's not like you're, I mean, unless you're a PR2 rower, which then you don't have a sliding seat anyway, right. like you, you're not using, you know, you're, you're then, flexing your knees bending your knees to get into a shorter and shorter hamstring as you go anatomically um, it can't be right. the limiting factor right yeah and so i think that's one area where we're just like learning a little bit more about the anatomy and how the muscles function kind of blows a hole in the theory in the first place except that like if you're just bolt upright at that rock over position then okay maybe we're going to look at that right Right. Uh, but then even, you know, it, when you're talking about para rowing kind of in that way, potentially like you don't have to have the, the footboards in the same place, you know, like yeah. if you, if you have someone positioned so that they, you know, you, you wouldn't want them almost like all the way locked so that they're limited by, you know, their, their hamstrings up at their hips, because maybe they can get just a teensy bit more if they're a little bit slacked there too. Um, I haven't played with rigging like that a ton in pair boats personally, but like logically that just, you know, it's like you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to lock, want to lock someone out there um, because of the same, you know, like why limit someone's hip motion by their hamstrings just as a uh, able-bodied rower doesn't, right? Because you bend your knees and your hamstrings let go. And not to say that you're not going to feel your hamstrings after a row, right? The the hamstrings <laughs> just just because they're not like limiting you because they're tight as you go up and down the slide like your hamstrings are still going to get sore and they're still going to get tired and that you know might potentially then backwards play into the conversation we had about Blake's article where your hip position starts to change and you know we start to play back and forth there but um you know I think the more we all, all learn about hamstrings the essentially the stronger you make them the more flexible they'll feel and be and you know the if we're talking about getting those hips back over again right the the longer you have before tight hamstrings are going to limit that um the stronger they are I, I will note that uh a, a group of researchers who were all a big fan of with the low back pain consensus document uh, still include hamstring stretching in their recommendation. I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> and I was uh, just like, well, maybe this is just because it's helped you to stretch your hamstrings generally. <laughs> and I, I think it's also a question that they don't put an exact number on, on where is the limitation. And so like there, there has to be a point at which tight hamstrings would affect your movement. So it's kind yeah, of just like a question of like, even, where is that number? Yeah. Or maybe it's just even like, uh, you'll feel better if you're not you know, like mm -hmm. maybe, you know, just a little bit of hamstring stretching does let you get 
everything else firing a little bit better if if your hamstrings aren't the first tight thing you feel as you're as you're getting on the water i don't know yeah i saw that in like all the appendixes and stuff and whatever of the low back consensus statement which i i'm still feel like i find something new every time i read it but um it's yeah i don't know i mean i wouldn't that's where as you said in the beginning i wouldn't say don't stretch your hamstrings but like let's look at it as part of the whole picture yeah 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 and the other thing that you mentioned i wanted to drill down on a little bit more is the difference between pure flexibility aka tissue length and mobility aka your control of the movement what do you think about the the difference there and the effect on on rowing or what rowers should be thinking about with those two yeah i mean i guess that's where and and you guys as strength coaches know this better than anybody but i feel like i for hamstrings in particular right you picture so how somebody can get into like a deadlifting position or a hip hinge or whatever in, in more of that kind of um strength environment kind of way and if somebody doesn't have the control over how to move their pelvis and how to keep their core connected and and how to do all that stuff it's like no matter how long their hamstrings are you like watch them try and do it and their their back is rounding and this is happening they're whatever and you're just like but your hamstrings work like why can't you do this right and that's where that control piece comes in because if somebody just hasn't learned how to feel where those various bodies parts are, whether it's, you know, how to feel what a posterior weight shift feels like, how to feel what like a core connection to, you know, like that ribs to pelvis kind of core connection so that they can keep everything moving together. You know, the the feel kind of piece of it. And then you have sort of that endurance, whether core endurance or hip, like stability endurance, you know, kind of aspects underlying so that you can then do these movement patterns, whether that's a true hinge in the weight room or obviously the rowing stroke is massive amounts of hinging over and over again, um, that, you know, just having the flexibility doesn't get you there. Um, that, you know, especially, I feel like in rowing, we don't see it as often just because <laughs> most of us find rowing because we're not overly nimble in other things. But um, I feel like you know, learning from one of my coworkers, Dave, who works a lot with gymnasts, right? They have insane amounts of flexibility, right? But for them, it's almost that they can get to that end range and over, over end range too easily. So they have to learn the control of like, you know, stopping their body almost from moving too far. And I feel like with when we're talking about potentially like low back positioning with rowing, right? You you sort of get into that that realm sometimes that people who tend to be on that more flexible end, if they don't understand control of their hips, of their core, of their shoulders, of their, you know, of their body generally, like, and they don't have the strength to support themselves to maintain that control throughout a workout that's when you start to see those breakdowns that eventually lead to injury, right? That's when you start to see that hip angle changing. That's when you start to see the low back rounding more. That's when you start to see knees do funky stuff, you know, because if you don't have that enough strength to have control, you just, you know, that's, that's where then you, you lose really that rowing connection and pieces break down and you're more susceptible to injury essentially if you if you lose that control during a workout Um, yeah and in in support of that too two of the researchers from the world rowing low back pain task force that we've talked with the most dr fiona wilson and uh kelly wilkie both physical therapists and in the rowing community everything themselves we had fiona wilson on our old podcast the strength coach roundtable talking about core training one of her favorite things she's it's not really core training and low back pain so much she had a deep squat to a box uh tempo progression that Mm -hmm. that that she really liked to use and so there it's training the core endurance to hold that angle while you're going through knee flexion and knee extension to really build up that stability and then the core training movement that i love the most i stole from kelly wilkie uh the seated rock back which is just training that hinge from the seated position with all of the anterior abdominal stability so um I, i definitely appreciated learning those two moves and then hearing from you too the message of working on these things outside of the boat 
and the impact that that can have on the movement inside of the boat. Something you've brought up through throughout this discussion is how people learning the movements on the land can then yeah. translate them better on the water. Do you have any extra yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess that's where I feel like you guys are kind of very on board with sort of, I mean, especially being strength coaches, you guys know the incredible value of how much you can learn about your body in the weight room and how much better you can move as an athlete, you know, by being challenged on land and not just in your sport specific movements. But, um, you know, I feel like it's very, very challenging with the number of various unpredictable and uncontrollable aspects of what happens in a boat to necessarily always rely on that environment to teach somebody something that is challenging for them to do, whether it is from a control aspect, whether it is, you know, from the, whether maybe they really truly just don't have enough strength to do what they're, you're asking them to. And it's going to be hard to see that and to determine why something isn't going well, just in a boat environment all the time, right? To be able to pull some factors away, to be on land and be like, okay, you know, can you touch your toes? <laughs> you know, can you do this? And not for the necessarily hamstring length test that we traditionally think of when we're trying to touch our toes, but like, can you move your pelvis over your body without losing your posture and your spine? You know, can you, can you get into a deep squat and stand up and maintain your back posture? Can you, you know, those, those pieces that like, can't see that with just like hopping in a boat and going out for a row all the time, you know, having, having the moment to learn your body as an athlete on land and as a coach to see how your athletes move on land. I feel like, you know, you can just progress so many more rowing skills that way without, you know, and then there's the benefit of hopefully not getting into that overuse side of stuff as easily. Right. I mean, that's, that's our, our sports biggest nemesis is we all just love to do more and more and more and more. And, um, you know, not, not realizing like, okay, we can train all these other aspects on land that one can help us so that we don't end up breaking down in various aspects quite as quickly so that we can get through a whole workout without losing, you know, our hip flexioning or our low back positioning. We can, you know, train other aspects of moving. We can move sideways. We can, you know, do, do different things so that our body actually knows itself better so that we can feel things better when a coach says like, you know, okay, for the next, you know, couple of minutes, we're all going to focus on, you know, whatever aspect of catch, finish, posture, some, you know, whatever it is, like to be able to just feel how your body is within itself better from outside of the boat to in the boat is just going to make you be able to respond and make changes faster on the water. And I feel like one of the biggest, um, pieces of research that I was like, is in my head, um, in terms of, you know, just building that threshold so that you, you know, I always just picture like, okay, do, how is somebody going to look at the beginning of practice? How are they going to look at the end of the practice? And how do we get them to maintain relatively the same great posture throughout so that we don't come out of the boat with just this slumped, totally spent, like a, another 10 minutes and you would have been looking at an injury kind of a posture. And that I feel like is where land training comes in because you can just up that threshold for how much work you are capable of doing without over exhausting the rowing movement. And I feel like Tim Gabbett's research is like one of my favorites in terms of, you know, just like how you build an athlete to be resilient and how you build, like you like up that ceiling so that you're not looking at that injury zone being like, you know, the shift from 70 minutes to 80 minutes of rowing. You're looking at it, you know, you're looking at so much more you can do with an athlete if you've just like use that land training time, you know, to, to up that, put more eggs in your basket. So you have more things you can do before stuff starts to fall apart. Yeah. Yeah. Those are all great points. I'm glad you said that. Cause I think it's, it, it could be a tough sell for rowers and coaches at first to know if I need to work my own water technique, I want to drill. I wanted to go do pause drills. I want to go do length. And so he, hearing that it's about more than that, and the, the value of kind of proprioceptive awareness from outside of the boat to be able to bring that skill back to the boat is I think huge. I mean, I personally, like as a rower, I feel like I became more coachable and more resilient and just like more capable in a boat when I shifted to having smart land training. 
and not just thinking of it as like, oh, well, this is just like something I have to check off in the week and coach says do this and whatever, right? It was like, I, when I shifted my intent of how I was using that time, like the number of things I felt like I was able to accomplish without like ridiculous amount of extra work in a boat, just it would, it would, I mean, there's no doubt that that's where it can come from, you know? And I feel like that it's something that our sport is starting to value more and more over time and it's really exciting it's going to be cool to see where we can all get like the more that that starts to happen yeah like anything you want to add yeah one of the things you made me think of was my thought process when someone isn't able to get into a good position is i'm never necessarily thinking about hamstring length or like spending a ton of time stretching hamstrings what i'm thinking about is positioning of the pelvis and I think you touched on this a little bit. So like, how can we help them get into a better position? So the hamstrings aren't the limiting factor, right? So like, if, if I were to look at it, like I'm going to, I'm going to look at the hip flexors that might be what's short and kind of rounding them forward. I'm going to look at the core, maybe, maybe a breathing exercise to kind of try to reset the pelvis. And then oftentimes they can get into that better position and, and maybe get to the point where you're talking about in terms of just being able to repeat good stroke after good stroke. Right. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I, yeah, I, that's what I would do too. I don't know. <laughs> I totally awesome. agree. I would, yeah. Um, yeah. It's it, cause you're right. It's, I mean, it's nice at least at this point, you know, your first thought isn't hamstrings. Cause I feel like that's, that's just the easy one, right? Like you, everybody knows that hamstrings go up there and your hamstrings feel tight and this, that, and the other, but um, knowing how many other aspects of so many things that can affect how your pelvis feels um, and how, easily you can rotate through and and honestly that's where so many people just don't know what they're supposed to be feeling for like you said in the beginning it's like some people don't realize like oh i can row without back pain you know or like oh i can row without feeling like my hamstrings are gonna rip off of me the entire time like i had no idea and just getting them to do simple just you know whether it is just like anterior posterior tilt to help them just figure out where their body is it's amazing how far really simple things like that go, especially when you're teaching people how to row and like, you know, instilling those good habits from the beginning and communicating like, listen, you got to tell me if this hurts or this feels funky or, or whatever, because, you know, too many people just let it go and, and think that's part of the sport. And, um, you know, so to the fact that your initial instinct is just not even hamstrings at all, I feel like you're in a, in a new bubble of people in terms of, of talking to athletes and rowers about how they're moving and what they're feeling, but changing, changing some of the dogma of coaching is one of the things that we try to do with signs of rowing. So uh, yeah. on that note, thank you. Thank you so much for coming here. We really appreciate your experience and, and sharing all of your knowledge with us. Everybody, please go check out powerhousephysio.com also so that then Lisa sees all the traffic and gets pumped up to write more so that <laughs> all, all the rest of us have more stuff to read that's how it worked for us right more positive feedback keeps you going you, you need it lisa is there anything else that you would like people to follow or, or look into i mean other than i guess i always encourage anyone who who does interact with me like tell me what you want to learn you know that's why i'm always happy to look stuff up i'm always learning so if i can share something that i'm learning with you and and help you figure out whatever you're trying to figure out that's fun for me too so and and what's your handle on instagram uh, Lisa Russell DPT. Um, and you, are you offering like any online training or anything where, where people can work with you or is it all in person? I mean, it's mostly in person. I mean, there's always the option for like some sort of virtual consult. I mean, granted for PT stuff, right? Like if, if I can help you connect with somebody else that's in person in your area, that that's something I'm happy to do kind of a thing. But, um, but yeah, no, we, I mean, we've been seeing people in person um, in our clinic in Boston ever since we've been able to, again, with COVID, um, the PT side of stuff, we never had to shut down. Um, and so if you're in Boston, come hang out on the Charles and come say hi. <laughs> there we go. Well, thank you again. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed it and we'll see you next time.